Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Women have been involved in aviation from the very beginning. Yet, I think I'm not alone in having a gap in my AV geekery for this intrepid group of women who took to the skies during the early and incredibly experimental days of flight. So when I saw Sally Smith's book, Magnificent Women in Flying Machines, I knew I had to dive into it. Sally starts in the 18th century and looks at the woman who took to the skies in the first balloons and also made a living not only from flying balloons, but jumping out of them too. Throughout the near 250 years of women pilots that the Magnificent Women in Flying Machines covers, Throughout the near 250 years of women pilots that Magnificent Women and Flying Machines covers, the love, passion and determination of each of these intrepid women is palpable and truly inspiring. So it's great fun to sit down with Sally and chat about a few of the women that she covers in her book. Given that Sally starts in 1785, I had to ask what was the starting point for her to look so far back? into British aviation history? Flight. Well, as, as a journalist, I was sort of always interested in everything. Um, and my background was a bit in aviation because of all the skydiving and ballooning I'd done. My parents in the Air Force and my son was mm. a long haul pilot. So we've got a bit of aviation interest in the family. And, um, and just one day I was thinking, who was the first British women's pilot? And I didn't know. And I asked my son, be a long haul pilot, who's the first British woman? He had no interest at all. And I thought, well, hang on, people should know this. So I tried to research it and I went on to Google and you try, it's really interesting. Google, first British woman pilot. Well, for my case, it came up Amelia Johnson while well, I knew she was American. So I Googled again and it, it, do it now and it comes up with Amy Johnson. And I knew, you know, she flew in the 30s, but I knew she wasn't the first British woman's pilot. And I thought, this is crazy. So I researched it and I finally found Hilda Hewlett, another story behind that, uh, Eda Cook, who was even more amazing. And then I thought, well, who was the first British woman parachutist? And researching that, and I found this amazing woman who was brought up in a Victorian workhouse. She was very nearly the very first woman parachutist in the world, but the American girl just beat her. But she had a phenomenal story, and I thought these are names that ought to be recorded properly, and that's how the book came into being. I have to admit, I kind of fell in love with all of them as I was going through it. <laughs> They're just such a wonderful group of, of women. And you, know, you, you mentioned that you're sort of a balloonist and things was that the sort of affinity because the first few are all balloonists and, and, and parachutists so w was that sort of did you really find an affinity with, with, with those women? it wasn't because of that particularly it was because i was doing it in chronological order and i thought that was mm. a sensible way to do the book and the book really just covers the the british women who were first and made significant first achievements in various forms of aviation and so of course that includes the first form of aviation which was mm -hmm. ballooning um, right up to going up into space and a space station. Yes, and uh, of, of course we have all the fun nowadays with first Britain in space and you have the, the Tim Peake, Helen Sharman mm -hmm. debates, which we, we're not going to get into um, because uh, it's not, not worth it. It was, it was Helen, dear listener. It was, it was Helen. But we're going to have a look at two of your magnificent women because we want people to buy the book and they're all fantastic. But we thought we'd go to the beginning and then we'll pop to the 20s and have a couple honourable mentions. But I'd, I'd love to chat to you a little bit about Margaret Graham because we're going right back to the 19th century. And this is ballooning as spectacle, isn't it? It's, Ma yeah, absolutely. it's almost a spectator sport, isn't it? But we, we've got we've got a little bit more about her to learn. So who, who was Margaret? Well, she, she had the first British women's pilot. And you say ballooning was a spectacle sport, but really it was because people were trying to progress in aviation and it was so expensive that they were looking at any ways they could to make money to so that they could continue with their efforts to fly. And Margaret Graham was a phenomenal woman because she came up from Bath, southwest England, and went to London, as quite a few people did in the 1810s, 1820s, to work as a domestic servant or as a shopkeeper, something like that. She linked up with a man called George Graham, who wasn't particularly, how can we say, he was honest, but he was a little bit on the edge of it. Um, but he had managed to get hold of a secondhand balloon and Margaret was attracted to him. 
And he was going to put the balloon up to make some money. He thought that was a good money-making idea. He was always short of money. And Margaret helped him. But on that very first flight that they did, they didn't fill the balloon full enough with gas. They were trying to save money. It didn't get off the ground. They'd attracted a lot of fee-paying audience. And instead of offering to pay their money back, um, George Graham just ran away and hid at the back of a tavern. And so it was a little bit of a, 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 a weird start to flying. But anyway, they kept going. They launched the balloon, filled it with gas, made a few displays and made quite a lot of money. And Margaret Graham, by this time, they'd got married. She'd had a kid. And George Graham, again, desperately trying to make money, thought, I know, if we had a women's pilot, we could charge double the entry fee to come and watch the launch. And he spoke to Margaret about this. Margaret had been around. She'd been up in a flight. She liked it. And she thought, yes, I think I could do that. Why not? So they put posters all over London. First woman to fly. She's going to fly a balloon. And they took the, put the balloon up. They set it up with gas. And with the crowds in front of them, Margaret stepped into the basket. The only controls at that time were sandbags and a little um, vent at the top of the envelope so that she could let a little gas out if they were going too high. She stepped into the basket, and against the cheers of all these crowds, she took off. Um, unfortunately, they hadn't filled the balloon full enough with gas because, again, George Graham was always trying to save money. And it, it, it took off. It didn't fly very high. She just cleared the top of Islington Church and then came down quite heavily at the back of a tavern in Stoke Newington. She came into an allotment just at the back of the tavern. But nevertheless, she'd flown. And she'd been the first woman to fly. On her landing, she wasn't given a lot of acclaim for being the first ever British woman's pilot because the innkeeper came out and yelled at her, tried to stab the balloon, and finally took her to court for damaging his allotment. But nevertheless, Margaret Graham was the first ever British woman pilot to actually pilot any aircraft of any sort. Um, what was interesting, though, is when she went on, because soon after that, her husband was put into prison for debt. And she was left alone with children um, in London on her own. And there was no social security, nothing, no help. And she thought, what am I going to do? And instead of rushing back home, she thought, well, I've flown the balloon once. I know what it's about. I can organize a business. And she took it over. She took over the business and started giving displays. Her husband came out of the prison and then started helping her. But from then on, really, it was Margaret Graham's business. She started giving displays all over England. And she was actually a phenomenal success. She had a lot of accidents, of course, because in those days, there was very limited knowledge about weather forecasting, and especially with a, a balloon. Um, she'd land on roofs and trees and all sorts of things. But nevertheless, she, she made a success of it. And she was very successful. So that was British first British ever woman's pilot. Terrific story. And she did it. She's absolutely fantastic. But let, let's talk about the kit for a second. So what are they, what are the balloons that they're flying made out of at this time? Because it, it, it's, you know, I guess today it's lo lots of fancy stuff. Yeah, they were mainly silk mm -hmm. and they were hand sewn usually by seamstresses around so that, of course, all the seams had leaks. So the gas inside would gradually go out. The silk wasn't particularly non-porous. It was just normal fabric. So that unless it was very good quality, um, again, you'd get quite a lot of leakage through it. And obviously they'd wear quite often so that they often have patches on them and sewn up with all bits and pieces. It was very much a, a beginning of, of ma new materials as well as of flying. And what gas were they using? Because in the book you call it coal gas, or because it's not hydrogen or uh, anything like that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. When they started, it started actually, the first gas balloon went off in, in France in 1783, just two weeks after the Montgolfia brothers flew. And they were using very basic, they've just learned that you can put sort of hot air over iron or hot steam over iron and gradually make gas. And, and that they were still using coal gas in those days, in the 1830s. Some, some of the balloons would actually hook onto the, the system that was being introduced into Victorian towns. So the, the same gas that was used to, to light the lamps, they were sort of siphoning off and putting it in balloons. So there was no consensus on what was best or not. It was still very much trial and error in those days. And yeah, you said that crashes were, were common. Margaret had one that very nearly could have been <laughs> catastrophic, really, because she was flying towards a big glass house. Yeah, she, well, she had she had a couple actually, but what what was two two aspects of that were interesting. Um, one that any crash she did have, the media were immediately onto her, saying, "What is this woman doing? Isn't this appalling? 
why is she um, embarrassing her sex so much by flying balloons instead of just being on the ground being a normal housewife? But um, anyway, the second that she had a few crashes, but the main one she had was what the um, London Exhibition in 1851. And this was a big event. It was when the Crystal Palace was built in Hyde Park and the exhibition was to show the best of product that was available at that time. It was a huge event meant to attract people from all, not over, all over Britain, but also from overseas because trains were coming in and people were becoming able to travel a lot more. Margaret thought, I've got to fly across this show. It's going to make my name as I'll be the best pilot ever. And so she arranged it and she set up on a quiet day when there wasn't much wind. She set up upwind of the Crystal Palace in Kensington Gardens on the edge of Hyde Park. And the crowd, the grounds were full of people, thronging with people. And she took off. Um, unfortunately, as she took off, she'd chosen a low wind day. But because of that, there was slight air current swirling around. And as she took off, her little gas balloon flew into the side of a, a tall flagpole and just put a little rip. So off she went, but she hadn't got the much lift as she wanted because of that damage. She couldn't land quickly because of the crowds below her. So she had to fly on. And that meant flying on to the Crystal Palace. As she flew onto the Crystal Palace, she was climbing a little bit and she thought she'd be okay. But as she reached it, she realized it was going to be touch and go. In fact, she, cl she cleared the top of the Crystal Palace by the, the reports afterwards, so it was less than three feet. If she'd come a little bit lower, she could have demolished the whole thing. It would have been one of the biggest disasters ever. As it happened, she did manage to clear it. But then because the balloon was still losing gas, um, she ended up on top of a, a big building in Arlington Street, just off Piccadilly. And, um, and she was injured and the balloon was a write-off. But, um, but at least she'd done her flight over Hyde Park and she'd done a flight over Crystal Palace. So she had succeeded to a certain extent. As someone who is a balloonist themselves, when when you sort of look back at these these early flights and and the the trials and tribulations of of, of Margaret making them, what's your take on on the early pioneers of balloon? Because they, they seem what I guess it would be called later intrepid daredevils, weren't they? Well, no, I, I think it's more than that. I think um, they were they were a lot more serious than I think people give them credit for. Um, mm -hmm. Some were just wanting to make a name for themselves and make money. But I think some, and, and certainly with Margaret, she was um, quite serious about her business. And she was running at the very best she could. And the fact that she did have accidents were inevitable in those days because they didn't have the materials and they didn't have the knowledge. So it was very much, it was pioneering, it was incredibly brave and incredibly determined. But I don't think it was frivolous in any way. I think there was still excellent ex the sort of little biography you do of her she was getting injured doing this very regularly wasn't it in, 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 an, in an age of uh, you know you think if you don't want to go back in time in case you have to go to the dentist but she she was getting hurt quite often wasn't she um not she, she had a few knocks she did have a couple of really bad accidents for sure mm. poor lady and i think then again it was um lack of money and she felt what else she could do and she'd got all this experience and in all fairness ballooning in those days when it worked it did bring in a lot of money mm -hmm. so it was a very good business to be in but uh, sorry a... but um, uh, but yeah so so i think they were sort of the injuries were they weren't life-threatening apart from on a couple of occasions and she somehow just got through them yeah i mean she could have given it all up but she clearly felt she wanted to go on incredibly the, there's there's a couple of the biographies you have in there of, of these women who you know the the press which would clearly as as they do now when anything happens with a female pilot sort of jumps on it but i guess at, at that time with shall we say flexible rigors towards journalism I, I suppose the knowledge that should even the smallest thing go wrong it would get blown out of all proportion made each flight Quite a stressful occurrence. Margaret Graham was a very feisty lady. Mm. Yes, yeah, she got into a lot of battles with the media because they were absolutely opposed to any woman doing something like this. Mm. And of course, at the time, in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, she was the only British woman who was flying. And so they went for her as often as they could. And I know there was one occasion when she took off and unfortunately um, she was blown gently into the edge of a building. She was taking off in a fairly small confine where people had paid money to watch her take off. And the balloon, the envelope of the balloon got lodged on the chimney and the mm -hmm. basket got um, sort of lodged 
just hanging below the roof line. And she couldn't get it off. She tried to dislodge it, but she couldn't. So in the end, she had to climb out of the basket. And luckily, she was near enough and could climb into the top window of this um, building. Well, the media really went for her. And, um, and instead of saying, you know, sad accident or well done for surviving or anything, all they could say was, what a terrible thing to have done. What is this woman thinking of? When she was up there and then she climbed into the building and not only was it an appalling concept for her to do it all, but all the crowds could look up and they could see up her skirt and see her bloomers. What was she thinking of? And that, that was the angle they took up. Not that, hey, here's a woman pushing back boundaries and, and showing that flight's possible. So um, poor Margaret, but she was very feisty and she, she used to write letters to the media all the time saying, this is rubbish and this is what I'm doing. So, you know, all kudos to her for sure. I really like Margaret that, that, you know, sad family life, lost her daughter and things, but you know, the grit that she sh yeah. showed that you've, you've been able to get across is just, it just makes you smile and you just want her to succeed. I'd love to meet her. I'd love to have met her. Mm. Oh yeah. Just a fabulous she, woman. Oh, on, honestly, she, she was fantastic. And, um, you, you, I think you do her great, great justice. But, but it, in all fairness, all, all these women mm. were fantastic in their own way. I mean, that's why every one of them makes a fabulous story because they just, although they're in different directions, whether they're ballooning, gliding, skydiving, or going up in rockets, whatever, um, they were still breaking boundaries and, and, and fighting against traditional belief that still exists mm. in many ways. Oh, a hundred percent. And, you know, it's, it is, it is a sad reality that that view that they had then in, in, in those days of the, of the press and things permeates through to today, that there's such a small percentage of all types of pilots, aviators and things mm -hmm. that, that, that are women. And I know there's, there's great strides to change that. And I'm trying very hard to, to welcome as, as many female guests as I can on, because it's far too easy to find middle-aged white guys like me doing this, but it's, it's far more interesting learning, learning about these intrepid women because mm. until i'd read your book it, this, this was a black hole in 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 my knowledge about aviation and it's it's important that i think we do well i'm so pleased Just because they're fab these, these names are down on record you know because otherwise mm. their fantastic efforts could just have been lost forever completely and i'm so glad they're there but we're, we're going to talk we're going to jump ahead now because we're going to go air racing and meet the the fabulous winifred brown oh who, <laughs> She was right. She she was, and it's it's this fantastic time. The sort of the twenties are going on. Flight is is becoming, I say, more accessible in the sort of upper middle upper class sort of way as more accessible could could be. But she was still quite early on the the women getting their pilot's license. Oh, that's right. She she started in the mid nineteen twenties, and even then mm -hmm. there were only a handful of women that actually got their pilot's license that, then although they were slowly coming up. And you're quite right about a class thing because it's very expensive. And mm -hmm. um, the women flying at Stag Lane in London, which was a big training school then, very few women because it cost a lot of money. So they went in opportunity, they didn't have the opportunity to learn. Um, Winifred Brown was exceptional because she, she, was, she did have a bit of money because she was born, she was the daughter of a butcher in Manchester and he, his chain of meat shops had done really well. So he had quite a bit of money and he married late. He had an, she had an older mother. And so Winifred Brown was born into a fairly wealthy family with two doting older parents. So the scene was set and it was very perfect for her. But that said, when she was 10, 10 years old, she weighed 10 stone. So she had a lot of teasing at school, but she was a very happy person. And she didn't seem to let this worry her and just went on and she... she Funny grew up and then her daddy bought her a car and then she had some boyfriends and then one boyfriend took her to Woodford Aerodrome which was the early Manchester airfield mm -hmm. and it just had one tiger then and um, and she went there with her boyfriend and saw the plane and she said oh I've got to learn to fly and the one instructor there said oh, I'm afraid it's very expensive but obviously no women he wasn't expecting a woman to be able to fly let alone get involved and Winifred said oh daddy will pay and daddy did pay. So she was lucky in the way she started. But that was the only difference between her and all the other women in Britain. Because after that, she worked really hard. And um, she wasn't particularly a natural flyer, but she, she just worked at it. And she became a, quite a good pilot. 
Um, she was a little bit frivolous about it, and she used to take boyfriends up and, and play a little bit. Um, and then she had a, unfortunate, she had an accident that really wasn't her fault. Um, she'd arrived at the Manchester Aerodrome, and there was a man there surrounded by one or two other people, and he was meant to be taking a, a film cartridge to a big launch over east of um, Manchester. And it was a film that was going to be, I don't know, it was some big promotion. And, um, and he couldn't, for some reason, he couldn't do it. And Winifred, in a happy, nice, happy way, said, oh, I'll, I'll fly it over for you if you like. And so she was told where to take it. And, and she said, oh, where's this landing field? They said, oh, it's all been worked out. Don't worry. There's a lot of people there to meet you. It's all been fine. Just go and if you can just deliver this, we'd be incredibly grateful. And so she said, yeah, OK, I'll do that. And she took off with her film canister on board and went and saw the field. And she thought it looks a bit short. But then she thought, well, it's a big film company and they've made all these arrangements. They must, they've checked it out. Must be OK. <clears throat> so she went down, landed beautifully. Um, but there was no wind and she realized she wasn't going to stop in time. The crowds didn't back off. They're all running up to her and it was all excited. And unfortunately, before she stopped, she'd killed a boy, one of the boys in the audience, in the people watching. It was a very sad occasion for Winifred and she was devastated by it. There was a court case after it um, that said no fault of hers whatsoever. And indeed it wasn't. She was a good pilot, but she gradually got her confidence back. And she took flying after that very seriously. And she still loved her flying. She went on a course, an engineering course to learn a bit about more engines. And she went on a navigation course as well. So she suddenly started to fly seriously instead of just having a lot of fun as a party girl. And then one day she was up at um, Blackpool and she saw a lot of planes landing. And she said, what's this about? And it was part of the King's Cup air race, which had started earlier in the 20s. And it was the race, I'm sure most people know about it, to um, it attracted the best pilots of the day. And it was a race round, of course. And obviously the winner got the cup and the trophy and a huge amount of acclaim and applause. And she just, looked at the... Just, just yeah, to explain on, it, if, if so, just to say, if, if, if someone doesn't know about the King's Cup, definitely look it up because it is, it is fantastic. But it's when we say a chorus, we, we basically mean England, don't we? It, it's, yes. it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's quite yeah. a chorus. Yeah, it's well, um, of course, cross, co about, cross country sort of job. Yeah, we're talking about 1920s, we're talking about days mm -hmm. when people would still go down and read railway station signs to find out where they were. I mean, they were, the instruments were minimal and getting lost was so easy and you couldn't fly in cloud because there were no instruments. So we are talking still about very early days in, in aviation. Anyway, she, she saw the pilots in the King's Cup areas and she thought, oh, I'd really like to enter that. And she found out about it. And then she told the, her friends at the club, oh, I think I'll enter it next year. And they said, Winifred, don't be ridiculous. You're a woman and you can't fly like that. You'll just embarrass yourself and you'll embarrass the club. Please don't enter. And she didn't like that. She thought that sounded a little bit too forceful for her. So she thought about it again. She thought, I know, I will enter anyway. It doesn't matter if I come last. I'll just do what I can. And that was the sort of buoyant personality she had. And so she entered. and then. The time came, it was July, I think, 1930, and the, the route would take a different air, well, they'd take a different route every year, but this route was starting in London at the Hamworth Aero Club, which was a, a big, prestigious air park in London at the days, in those days. And it would start from there and fly around, of course, around England. So she flew her little plane down to, to Hamworth and she um, landed and went up to the clubhouse. And that night, this is the night before the race, um, all the other entry pilots, and there are over 100 other entries, um, were gathering there for a big party. And then all the pilots had got various rooms in the clubhouse. It was a very big clubhouse to stay there that night. And as she went in, one of the officials came up and said, Winifred, Winifred Brown? And she said, yes, she said, oh, I'm really sorry. You can't stay here tonight. We haven't room for you. And what it was, was she was a woman and she had the wrong accent. Because in those days, again, aviation was very much the sport of the affluent, the well-spoken, and Southerners as well, to a certain extent. Here's a woman from Manchester, slightly overweight, lovely, happy character, but with the wrong accent. She just didn't fit in the scene, and she was refused a room. So she thought about this. She went off to a local pub and spent the night there. 
And they showed how feisty she was because the next day she didn't hesitate. She thought, well, I'll still take part. I'll still do what I can. I paid my entry fee and I'd like to take part. So, but by now she was fairly, uh, fairly nervous, but nevertheless, she arrived at the clubhouse and all the other pilots were thronging around. And she finally got into a little plane, Lavian. And once she got in the cockpit, she felt a lot happier. She felt more confident it, because she knew where she was. We should just Sorry, point man. out, this is a, a, fe a feisty Manchester lady in a Manchester designed and built aircraft from, from Avros as Absolutely. well. So she, she's yeah. she's flying the flag for Manchester all around. Well, she was really, but no one appreciated that in Manchester. They just thought she was going to be a huge embarrassment. And she, um, anyway, and so she, uh, they, it was a handicap race and there were some fast planes and top pilots there. But she took off in her slot and flew down to Hamble and her navigation was spot on. And then she turned west and flew over to Bristol and, and landed where they were fueling, grabbing a sandwich and, and going on. And at that time, she wasn't last, and she thought, oh, good, I'm not last. That's brilliant. And that gave her a lot of confidence. <laughs> she then flew up to um, the next leg, was uh, west of Manchester, and she landed there with the others and, um, and again refueling. And then all the pilots in the race there, they had some bad news because the next leg was up to Newcastle before going back to London. And to fly from Manchester to Newcastle, the direct route was over the Pennines. Well, no cloud had come in, and it had come right down to, cloud, to land level. And no pilots in those days would fly through cloud. Um, they didn't have the instruments or the knowledge. It was a very scary thing to even get caught in cloud. So they all got their maps out and started rerouting their routes to go further north and then try and clear the Pennines where the land came lower. They'd go round and then turn east up there. Margaret got her map out and she was looking at rerouting up north. And she thought, well, hang on a minute. I know this area. This is the area where I... I learned to fly. I've done hours and hours in the air here. And she knew that east of Manchester were the Pennines, but directly east through the Pennines was the Woodhead Pass. And she's flown through that several times. It was a, a valley that went through the top of the Pennines. And she thought, I've often flown there when there's cloud cover everywhere else, but it's been clear in the pass. Shall I give that a go instead? You'd save a lot of miles. Anyway, she thought about it and she watched all the other pilots as they were taking off. And when she took off, she started heading north. And then she thought, I'll give it a go. And it was an extraordinary decision. And, um, but that's what she did. And she turned east and started heading across the area she knew so well towards the Pennines. And she got to the beginning of the hills as they started going up. And she could see the top of the hills all covered in cloud. But she got into the pass and went on and the cloud came down as the land rose and soon she was right at cloud base and she was looking down and thinking oh have I done the right thing and then on she went and then it was becoming misty and she was looking down and she could hardly see the ground and it was all becoming very very faint and she thought I'm going to have to turn around and now I'm going to be so far behind everyone it really will be an embarrassment but she just held on another second and she saw just ahead of her a glimmer of light just a flash of sunlight on the ground ahead of her in the valley. And she held on another second, and there was another flash, and then the light, and she was through. And she suddenly realized, I've got through the pass. And she flew on, and the cloud level went up, and she got into clear air, and she was there on the east of the Pennines. And she, then she flew directly up to Newcastle, to a much shorter route than all the other pilots had taken, and she landed. And it was, it was, again, great navigation on her behalf. When she landed at Newcastle, she learned she was first, um, which I suppose in some ways didn't surprise her because she had made this enormous shortcut. But she knew there were some very fast planes coming up behind her. So she refueled quickly. And as she went to take off, there was actually a plane in front of her right down at the end of the runway. Normally, she'd have gone round again. But this time, she thought, I'm, not, I'm really going to give it my best. So she revved up and off she went climbed really fast, cleared the plane, and headed south for London. And she got to hand with it. And I must say, she did very well on the navigation. P plane, some planes in this race got lost. Others ran out of fuel. Mm. So there was a lot going on. She got to Hamworth, and as she saw it, she started sort of approaching it. And she could see at her back, the right-hand side, there was another plane coming along lower, below her and faster. And she thought, I'm going to beat this. And she put her little plane into a really heavy dive. And it went up to 100 miles an hour, 120 miles an hour. The plane, you know, was at well over its maximum, really, shaking around. 
but she dived down and she landed at Hanwerk. And as she rolled to a halt, everyone started running up to her and she realised quite quickly that she'd won. And as all the other planes were landing around her, all the club officials and all the mighty and the good and the great that had come to this big air race were running up to her, wanting to shake her hands and say, well done. And she did. She did incredibly well. And she actually won the race. And of course, then she had to give a speech at the clubhouse and she wasn't ready for any of this. And nor were any of the people there either. No one could believe a woman had won the air race. And she had a telegram from the king. And it was just a very, very big thing in the days. But that night, um, one of the officials from the club came up to her and said, oh, well done, Miss Brown. You've done so well. Um, we've reserved the very best room in the clubhouse for you. It's all ready for you as the winner <laughs> of the race. And Winifred, bless her, and holding this big cup, people all around her said, I wasn't good enough for you last night, and I'm, I'm not going to stay here tonight. And she went back to her pub where she had stayed the night before. So, you know, incredible woman, really. <laughs> quite, quite again, feisty and determined and, and um, not going to be put upon by, by anybody. But the big thing was, I mean, it was just a fabulous story. And, of course, she, she was the first big sort of female race winner in, in the UK and, and just a great name. I love that she went back to the pub. That's yeah, yeah, yeah I but, know. Yeah, it's just sort of keep your room. I'm off. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll just thank the there's... pub, thank you, mate. And of course, some of the yeah. men, I think they must have been aghast. Yeah, absolutely aghast mm. and astonished. Because it, it was it was huge news because these air races were sort of wall to war co coverage thing at, at, at the time. Oh, it, absolutely it was... huge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the winner of the Schneider Trophy, everyone was taking part. There's an absolutely lovely picture in your book of Winifred with the trophy and, and she just looks pleased as punch and it's, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's just lovely. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's that sort of handsome classic sort of big cup, isn't it? And, oh God. I mean, this was a massive event. I mean, they had, you know, the top yeah. names of everywhere were there for the big presentation and no one, no one expected it to go to a woman. It hadn't even been dreamed of. I adore Winifred. She's fantastic. It's... <laughs> We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Director of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we're at the Pima Air and Space Museum with our Douglas A-20G Havoc. A-20 Havoc was an attack aircraft light bomber of World War II. Originally built and designed with a glass nose with a bombardier. In the Pacific Theater, like B-25s, Pappy Gunn came up with this idea of manning these aircraft with solid noses and a bunch of machine guns for doing strafing attacks on Japanese airfields and attacking Japanese shipping. This aircraft is an actual combat veteran. It flew with the 89th Bomb Squadron in New Guinea uh, on a mission, uh, I think bombing WEWAC. It was damaged and made an emergency landing in a swamp in New Guinea. The crew was recovered and the aircraft sat there pretty much forever until it was found in the 80s, and in the early 90s, it was recovered by the Royal Australian Air Force. This A-20 with another one that they had, they restored the one Helen Pelican, which was another combat veteran from the Pacific. They used a lot of the parts from this aircraft for that aircraft. Then actually went to a civilian owner, and then we ended up buying from that civilian owner and finished up the restoration, put it on display here. It's a unique aircraft in the fact there's only about four, if I recall, A-20 Havocs anywhere on display in the world, with one in a private collection, one at the Air Force Museum, one here, and one in a private collection in Russia. But uh, I'd say it's always been one of my favorite aircraft, I think just because of the lack of them as survivors and also just seeing a lot of those cool photos from World War II where you see these A-20s coming in low over a ball, bombing Japanese cruisers and, and transports. And, you know, they're like literally flying right like at mass height over these ships. Um, so I just always found it to be a pretty cool airplane. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And we're back with Sally Smith discussing magnificent women and flying machines. So it's funny at this time, I, I'm going to go slightly off our script here because the sort of women that you have in your book, you, you've got the two Lady Marys as well. And I, I throw them in only because I saw it was last week, the RAF Museum tweeted out that it was the anniversary 
of, he says, quickly looking, Lady Mary Bailey departing London on 9th of March, apparently. That's right. Yeah. Which was fun. But I have to admit, I think uh, Lady Mary Heath, she's she's far more interesting. Sort of the, think, the, the limerick think... lass who <laughs> made sure she had her even, evening evening dress with her in the aircraft. I, I just I, I, I thought she was fantastic, too. Well, I think people prefer Mary Bailey because she was um, probably the, oh, this sounds awful at this time, but she was the nicer woman, I think, possibly, in a character wise. So people take to Mary Bailey. Mary Heath was more of an entertainment, but actually, what a woman. I mean, she when she was two, I think, no, under two, her father bludgeoned her mother to death. I mean, she had a hell of an upbringing. And, um, and, Half of her reason, I think, for wanting to progress in, and be a pilot and be a good pilot and win races and do long distance flights was because she was pretty desperate to make a name for herself. She wanted to establish herself because she'd had this very, very insecure, peculiar upbringing. But that said, she, she did that and, and she achieved it. And um, I mean, her marriages, again, when she, you know, she was in her twenties and married a rich man over 70 and you do wonder how much of a love match that was. So I suppose we have got that suspicion about our Mary, but, um, <laughs> but that said, you know, she, she had a purpose and she probably kept him quite happy, but she also obviously used his money to go flying and she loved the social side of it. She was being socially recognized and being important was hugely important to her. And that's how she conflicts with the other Mary Bailey. Um, the two of them were two big sort of long distance pilots in the very early or late twenties, early thirties. Um, because Mary Bailey already came from an aristocratic family. She didn't need to establish herself. She was flying for the love of flying. Mary Heath was flying more than anything because it's a really good way to make a name for herself. So they were a compo sort of opposing in that respect. And that's why Mary Heath would take fur coats with her. So that when she got out of the plane, she looked glamorous. And she'd attract attention and she'd take high heels with her and change in the cockpit. So as she landed, she could step out of the plane and look gorgeous. So there was a, a fabulous element to her. But, um, I mean, and she was a very good pilot. And when she flew up through Africa, from, she flew from Cape Town to London on that flight. It's easy to belittle her because she took a tennis racket with her and she'd stop where she could and, and go to social events. She even took time off to go on safari. But. Underneath that, she actually flew from Cape Town to London. I mean, an astonishing thing to do in the, you know, late 1920s, early 30s. And, and finding airfields to land on. And, and she had to put down a couple of times because she hit bad weather. And, um, and she at one point put down and she was only met by local natives. So there were lots and lots of problems. And she did get through it. So although she had that funny character and was a very much look at me person, Nevertheless, she did some incredible flying. There's that fantastic story you, you tell of, of, of the Lady Mary's meeting in Khartoum. Because <laughs> uh, just, just, just to make it clear to the listener, um, Lady Mary uh, Bailey was flying from London to Cape Town and Lady Mary Heath was flying from Cape Town to London. And they they met, in, met in Khartoum and they threw, a, as, as is the thing, British society throws a party in, in the middle of nowhere. And of course, Lady Mary shows up in full evening wear, doesn't she? It, you just think, and Lady Mary Bailey didn't have anything. It was great. I mean, it was just extraordinary. Mary Heath had, had taken off first. She was flying up from Cape Town to London. And it was not a race or anything, but Mary Bailey wanted to fly down from London to Cape Town because her husband had business interests in Cape Town. And she thought she'd learned to fly and she liked flying. She thought, oh, I'll fly down there as well. And she wasn't doing it as a race or anything. She was just doing it to challenge herself. And when she took off from London, flew across the Med and then went down across to Cairo. And she was doing it gently. She got, had a few problems in car, just leaving Cairo because some sand got into an engine, so she had to put down. But on she went, but it wasn't desperate. Mary Heath was desperate to get the record. She wanted to be the first woman to fly across Africa. And so she was very determined to do this. And, but it just happened that their flights coincided. And so they were flying across Africa at the same time. Extraordinary story. And Mary Heath, after a whole load of adventures, finally reached Khartoum and put down. And when she landed, she'd heard this other woman, Mary Bailey, was coming down too and, and probably going to land the next day. And Mary Heath wasn't really happy about that because she thought it's going to take some of her credit away. 
And anyway, that's what happened. But then the next day, Mary Bailey, the other English girl, did arrive at Khartoum. So there were two English women on this remote airfield in the middle of Africa. I mean, it's just an extraordinary story. But of course, as Matt said, all the English, there was an English settlement there. And um, all the officials got together and welcomed these two pilots. They didn't know about any rivalry between them, and they thought they'd give a big party. And so Mary Bailey just had arrived dusty. She was just flying down south to see her husband. She hadn't brought anything particular with her. Mary Heath, because of her wanting to look her best all the time, had in her little plane packed evening dresses and, and long um, high heel shoes and all sorts of things. And so when they arrived at this party, um, there was Mary Heath, dolled up to the nines, looking absolutely gorgeous, and Mary Bailey still in her dusty flying clothes. And Mary Heath said a wonderful sentence in front of everyone. Some of the men did comment on it. They said, oh, Mary, dear, you look so tired and so jaded. I mean, how brave of you to fly out of England when you'd never flown out of England before. Um, I do hope you're all right. And a real put down at the beginning of this party. It was really funny. <laughs> but anyway, so the two... Well, warring British women pilots, anyway, survived the party and on they went to fly and both of them were successful. I adored that story. It's just that little, little, little spark of competition on one side and the complete indifference on the other. And yet there's, there's yeah. needle as, as, as they make their way down and up. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's the most astonishing story. It really was. As, as tempted as I am to just start picking out more magnificent women from your book sadly I, i'm not but we do have to give a couple honorable mentions and i have to try to work diana bernardo walker into any podcast <laughs> i can work diana bernardo walker and everything about her her family that she's just the most remarkable remarkable lady she's one of your quicker biographies towards the end but when you were sort of looking at that sort of period of the ata and, and um, pauline gower who, who of course deserves I need to do a whole podcast on, on Pauline Gower. And of course, her friend, the mechanic, whose name's just gone straight out of my head. Um, yeah. oh, but Diana, you know, we, we sort of have been talking about two society women. She was possibly the, the society woman presented, presented to the king. My favorite story about her, she was taught the forward defensive stroke by Don Bradman on her, on her dad's lawn and, and things like that. Yet, yeah, She's just fantastic. I'd love to hear what you we, you think of her because I can I can just sit here and, and just I just wish gush. I could have met her. I mean, the, the whole her whole family story is hilarious. I mean, you know, the fact that her great grandfather was a Barrow boy in the East End of London, and um, and even the story how they got the name Bernardo. She should have been Diana Isaacs. And um, mm. anyway, it's in the book. I can't tell the story now, but it's hilarious how they got the surname Bernardo and how they made their money of going out to Africa and and finding diamonds. But her father, Wolf Bonato, was a well-known racing driver in the 1920s, Bentley racing driver, and, um, and very good and very much a man about town. Her parents got divorced when she was quite young, but both parents remarried and they both had adequate income. So she had a great childhood because um, she was doted on whichever parent she was at, staying at. And um, so she was brought up with a lot of confidence and a lot of fun. And when she was in her late teens, she was as many society women in those days where she was presented to court in a long white dress as a debutante. So, um, so that was the sort of upbringing she had. And, um, and she learned to drive, but she was still being chaperoned to a certain extent. And she heard about flying and she heard that there was a, a, you know, you could learn to fly as a woman. And she thought that might give her a little bit more freedom because she was still being, especially by her mother, um, not allowed out on her own. And she was quite an independent young girl, very attractive and wanted to live life. Um, so she mm. went down to Brooklands and signed on to learn to fly. And she went to Brooklands really because she knew her father had raced around there on the lovely track there. And she knew there was a flying school there. So that's why she went to Brooklands and she, she learned to fly there. And she did quite well and she learned a bit. But then the war was coming and, um, and she heard about the ATA, which Pauline Goa had set up. And she thought, well, that sounds fun. She, in fact, starting at the beginning of the war, she started driving ambulances. So she was going to do her bit. Um, but then she heard about the ATA. And she thought, well, that sounds a lot more fun than driving ambulances. And I've got my license. Maybe I can get in. Well, she'd only got 10 hours flying time at that time. So when she heard that they'd given her a test, she really did a bit, few practice flights and really learned what she could. And 
she passed the test to become part of one of the few women pilots in the air transport auxiliary. The, unfortunately, the day after she did her test, she went riding to celebrate and had fell off, had a bad accident. She was in hospital for six months. So her start on the ATA was actually delayed. But then finally she got flying. And was very pleased. And, and like all the ATA girls, are just fantastic. I mean, they were giving, given just a small book of, of ferry pilot notes and just given whatever plane they had to fly. And I mean, they were doing hurricanes, spitfires, wellingtons, just flying anything anywhere, which is what they used to call themselves, the anything anywhere group. And, um, and she was doing that, but she was still a little bit of a party girl and Occasionally, she'd be flying from, I don't know, maybe Gloucester to Oxford or, or Southampton, where she was based for a while, up to Manchester to deliver a plane. And she'd drop off if maybe a friend who was living in a country home that had a big grass field, so she'd land, or maybe it's a ne nearby airfield, and she'd stop off and have a picnic or go and have lunch with her friends. And, um, and this got around a bit, and she was told not to do it, but she was just a fun girl. And occasionally, when she was based down in Southampton, um, she'd get a train up to London, go to an all-night party, and then end up back in Southampton early in the morning to now deliver a Wellington up to Northampton or something like that. You know, she was just a, a good pilot, but having a lot of fun in life. Um, things changed a little bit because she, um, she had a serious boyfriend. She had lots of boyfriends, but then she had a serious boyfriend. He was killed in the war. And then she became engaged. Hmm. You know, I mean, hmm. Diana was just part of a, a lively group. And they were doing astonishing things. And the energy of them all was, you know, they didn't bother about sleep a lot of the time. But anyway, but she, she went on flying. And then she did get engaged. And, yeah, as you said, he um, sadly died. And but anyway, they went on. And finally, after the war, um, she started, I think, flying with the, the group of air women, trans air women that had been set up by the government to encourage women into flight. And she started just doing some work for them. And eventually she got the opportunity, well, she wanted to fly a jet and jet planes were coming in. Um, the first jet, the Gloucester Meteor, I think, um, had come in a bit late for the, for the war. And I think Veronica Volkers was the first to fly a jet. And in 1945, she delivered one, I think it was, on the, um, when she was in the ATA. But basically, women went flying jets. But Diana wanted to do that. and then. After that, when she had done that, she thought, oh, I'd love to go through the sound barrier. And it was something she wanted to do. And it was possibly part of her nature just to keep pushing herself all the time. And she, she'd got a child by this time, so she was doing very well. Um, but she, she, anyway, she pushed herself. And it was thanks to a, a colleague that she knew at the Air Ministry that she actually finally got permission to train on it. It was a lightning. And she went up and did a simulator course, which had come in in those days. And then in, I think, um, 1965, she flew and she became the first woman to go through the sound barrier. It was a lovely story. And, and actually, it was a happy ending for, for this woman who'd, who'd had a fabulous beginning to life and then had a tricky time through the war. And then back, back to sort of having fun and, and enjoying her life again. No, it's a lovely story. Yes, it did. Just the, the whole circle she, she ran in, with her at the centre, just the most you know, remarkable. The reason she was able to, to get through that was the wonderful connections that she'd made all through her life that she then worked religiously to, to make sure that she could, she could achieve that. I, I, I just think she's the most remarkable. My dad got to meet her, and I, I think I, I was telling you this on, on our email exchange, and I was a stupid teenager who was off doing other things at the Eden Bridge in Oxted Agricultural Show, which is August bank holiday, everybody. It's a fantastic day out. My dad spent the day with Diana. I spent the day, you know, being a teenager. And he still yeah. holds that over me to this day because he just he smiles whenever you mention her name because she was just apparently the most wonderful lady. I think she had a terrific character, didn't she? Yeah. And I don't think it was just because she was brought up with money and it wasn't just because of her connections. I think actually if she had been brought up in a poor household, she was still shone out as a star. She had a lot of her father in it as well. She had mm -hmm. an incredible drive like, like he did. And he, yeah. you know, his, his no, story definitely. is remarkable. How, you know, taking his family to court to get his inheritance and things. I, I think she oh, grew I up in a very <laughs> independent minded house. And, you know, the, the relationship with Whitney Strait, who was a great racing driver. And it's, oh, well, it, it's, absolutely. It's, it's fun. And she had this child. 
she had Whitney Strait's child, which I think is just wonderful. Barnaby, I think, yeah. Yes, he, yeah. he's. I I think we need to we we need to wrap up, but we cannot wrap up without my favourite <laughs> unsung British woman who. For over the last few years, I've been jumping up and down to mention her name. And that, of course, is Helen Sharman, who's the first Briton oh. in space, yes. who the, the government would probably not like to remind as she was a technically a commercial passenger. But I just love her story that, you know, sat in traffic, listening to the radio and there's an advert for, for people to go in space. And it's like 18 months later, she's on Mir. It, her, her story is just fantastic. And one that's kind of been overshadowed by Tim Peake, I think, which is which is a great shame because I think hers is far more interesting because of not only having to to go to Russia to train, but to learn Russian, to learn technical Russian, um, mm. to be able to go up. It, I, I I adore her. The dedication that Helen had, and, and luck, for mm. all the wonderful women in the book, including Amy Johnson, all of them, um, which all had a fantastic story. The love about Helen Sharma was that I could actually speak to her. And yeah. once you talk to her and find out, you know, what it was really like to be in space and the work she did. I mean, the first she went to Russia to learn how to be a cosmonaut. But the first three months she had to learn Russian because she the whole all the instruction was in Russian. A, a phenomenal challenge. And she did it all. I mean, she was brilliant. Mm. And um, and then you talk to her about what it was like in space. And it just brings home to you, not just a blue planet, but all the little things she was telling you about how you live with, you know, sort of without gravity, obviously, um, but the sight of the earth below. And she she described some stunning scenery that you don't really get in normal official aviation reports, but how the lightning would flash around from cloud to cloud um, right across the, the hemispheres and then go back again. And, and just it was just wonderful to speak to Helen. And the fact that she'd managed to do it, to get through all that training and then get up on the space shuttle and get it up to the Mir station was just phenomenal. No, fabulous. Well, they're all they're all brilliant women. Every one of them. That's why I'm so pleased they've been recorded now, because every one of their names, you know, should be known, really. And your book is called Magnificent Women in Flying Machines, and they are each and every one magnificent. And Sally, I thank you so much because I had an absolute ball reading your book. And like I said, I fell in love with each and every one of them. <laughs> well, they are lovely, aren't they? Lovely women. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. I cannot thank Sally Smith enough for joining me here on The Damcasters. Her book, Magnificent Women and Flying Machines, really touched me. It was a great read, and all of the incredible women that she covers are just magnificent. So as always, I can encourage you to pick up the book because it is a fantastic read. And it's out now from the History Press, who were very kind in providing me with a copy to have a little read of. One of the things I have noticed with this podcast, though, is that when I have female guests on, or the topic is female aviators, numbers tend to drop a bit. So I've decided to do something about it, and that is to double down on female guests and topics of female aviation. So mainly starting over the next few weeks, you're going to be seeing many more incredible women historians and pilots coming in to talk to us about their love of flight and the subjects that are close to their heart. As you've seen from Sally, Women in Aviation is fantastic. There are some incredible tales out there. And even now, we have some incredible women blazing trails in aviation. Aviation is still writing its history, and we still have a lot of prejudice within it. So we need to talk about it. And that's what we're going to be doing here. And I hope you're going to join us along the way. I've had so much fun chatting with Sally and reading her book. And it's just invigorated me to continue on this thread more. And I'm really excited by some of the guests we've got coming up. And I'm not going to spoil it now because we're a little bit away from a couple of them. But we really do have some interesting tales of women kicking open the doors to areas of flight that were not thought proper for women to do. So... Please pick up Sally's book. It is available on our bookshop and it's available from all good and evil booksellers out there. And I'd like to thank the team at the Pima Air and Space Museum for their continued support of the podcast. For all the latest from them, you can check out their website at www.pimaair.org. Follow all their social medias because they've got some fantastic clips going on, especially for the Titan Missile Museum too, where they're doing lots of behind the scenes bits and pieces as well. 
As always, I have to thank our supporters on Patreon. It is super kind to have their continued support. You can join from just £3 a month. You get these episodes as soon as I get them edited. Plus all the news that I was teasing before, they're going to get it first. Now, I know times are tough and that's not going to be for everybody. I completely understand that and we're going to continue to pop these episodes out for free. What I would ask people to do is to tell your friends if you like us. If you don't agree with me, let me know. Best way to do that is to leave a review on your podcast of choice. Stick some stars into Apple Podcasts and it helps the algorithms to do whatever it is the algorithms do to move the podcast up and down in the charts. Recently, the Downcasters has been as high as number eight in the United States and number 12 in the UK on the aviation charts, which is amazing. So, as you can see, reviews help and you guys listening and telling all your friends has been fantastic. So, until the next time, thank you so much for listening and do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone, and it is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.